Hi, it's Hadir Urza again. Welcome to the lecture on sensitization. Well, <clears throat> uh, in the previous uh, lecture, which was on habituation, I explained how habituation is actually induced in, in, in aplasia and uh, with some, of course, historical remarks. <clears throat> historical remarks and well, uh, in this lecture, I'm going to explain what sensitization is and how it is induced in aplasia, and I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, molecular basis of short-term and long-term sensitization. Okay, so this is the outline of this lecture. Okay, and this is the second part of the first section of the lectures on implicit memory. Okay, so let's talk about sensitization um, and I want to define sensitization <clears throat> just like the way I define habituation. Well, I'm going to actually explain how sensitization is induced in an organism like a plesia. Well, uh, so imagine we have, again, that um, uh, organism like a plesia, and we uh, stimulate the, for example, the siphon of, of, of a plesia with a tactile stimulus. So we, uh, with the mild stimulus, okay, nothing scary, nothing uh, intense, and of course we uh, we expect a, a mild uh, gill withdrawal reflex, and uh, that is what we see, okay, if we uh, stimulate the organism with a tactile stimulus, we see a very normal, uh, not a very intense uh, response, but. Next, what we do is that we, we scare the animal, okay? For example, we, uh, we stimulate the tail of the aplasia with an electric shock, okay? And we scare the animal, and the, the electric shock is a very scary, it's a very intense stimulus. And what happens is that, of course, because the sti uh, stimulation is intense, the stimulus is intense, we're going to have, uh, uh, <clears throat> we, have uh, we see actually a, a, a more intense gear withdrawal reflex than the one we saw with uh, a, a mild tactile stimulus. Okay, so what happens here is that when the tail is shocked, electrically, the animal is scared, so the gill withdrawal uh, reflex is much greater now. What's interesting is what happens next. Next, we stimulate the siphon again, again with that mild stimulus. What happens next is that we see that the gill withdrawal reflex is greater than the first time that we stimulated the, uh, the siphon with that again mild stimulus. Somehow, that electric shock to the tail made the animal, made the aplasia uh, sensitive, more sensitive to even less harmful stimulus, uh, stimulations, okay? And that is the essence of a stimulation, you know, in, in, in sensitization. In sensitization, the animal, the organism, is, uh, becomes more sensitive to certain types of uh, uh, stimulus or, or stimuli. And, and uh, <clears throat> Unlike habituation, you know, in habituation we had one a mild, one type of a stimulus. We had that mild tactile stimulus to the siphon, and we repeated that same mild stimulus over and over until the animal gets habituated. But in sensitization, we have n two types of stimulation. We have, uh, uh, again, that mild stimulus, but we also have that uh, intense one, okay? That, uh, for example, that electric shock to the tail. Okay, this is the essence of, of sensitization. <coughs> but like habituation, sensitization also has two forms, short term and long term. And uh, yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to talk about. You know, that's, that's in, that was the introduction to sensitization, not all about sensitization. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's see. Um, Again, this is our experimental setup. Uh, we saw uh, uh, somewhat a similar uh, 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 experimental setup in habituation, but it's, uh, you know, we didn't have the tail, 
okay? So, <clears throat> as I mentioned in, in the last video, in the last lecture, there, are, there, is, a, there is a very interconnected uh, microcircuitry um, between the tail and the siphon, and also between the siphon and the uh, motor neurons, which in a way the gill, okay? So what happens, as I told you, is that first we, uh, we do that tactile stimulus <clears throat> to the siphon and we're going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, we see a mild, normal gear withdrawal reflex. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we stimulate the tail with uh, a, a new type of a stimulus called, called sensitizing stimulus. <coughs> um, I think... Uh, another name for this is facilitatory or facilitating uh, stimulus. But anyway, uh, sensitizing stimulus, and that is an electric shock. And the role of this electric shock or sensitizing stimulus to the tail is to scare the animal. So it becomes more sensitive to even less harmful concurrent um, stimuli, stimulus or stimuli like that um, uh, tactile stimulus to the, to the siphon. And so what happens when we electrically shock the tail is that it activates a bunch of sensory neurons like the siphon. The tail also has some sensory neurons which innovate the skin of, of the tail. And those sensory neurons are not directly, you know, some, some of them are directly um, uh, connected to these motor neurons, but some of them are uh, are no, 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 sorry. Uh, these sensory neurons are not, directed to, uh, not directly connected to these uh, motor neurons, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> but they are directly connected to these facilitating interneurons, okay? And I already, again, mentioned uh, that there are three types of facilitating interneurons, and in this uh, lecture, I'm going to only talk about serotonergic ones. Those uh, facilitating interneurons, which uh, uh, secrete Ser uh, serotonin. So, these sensory neurons are activated by that electric shock. They activate these facilitating interneurons. What these interneurons do, uh, do is that they, they make an axonic synapse, okay, with these sensory neurons. And they somehow make this synapse stronger. And by by the strength of a synapse, you know, I'm going to actually explain what do I mean by uh, the strength of a synapse or the facilitation of a synapse, but uh, <clears throat> what they do is that they somehow facilitate or make this uh, synapse, okay, stronger. And, and so hence, this, so these are strengthened, so now stronger synapses, when we do that tactile stimulus again, since these synapses between the sensory neurons and motor neurons are stronger, we're going to have a stronger gill withdrawal reflex. So this is the cellular uh, <coughs> mechanism of sensitization, okay? And in, in, uh, later I'm going to explain the molecular uh, mechanisms as well. Now let's see what happens um, in more detail. So, uh, the actual potentials in sensory neurons in, in, the initial, uh, in the initial condition and in a sensitized animal, um, almost no difference, okay? But what happens in the motor neuron EPSP, the EPSP in motor neurons, is that <coughs> uh, before uh, sensitization, we have a mild, normal EPSP in motor neurons caused by these sensory neurons. But in a sensitized animal, because these synapse between the sensory and motor neurons is facilitated, we have a larger EPSP in motor neurons. And as a result of that, we have uh, in sensitized animals, since we have a larger EPSP in motor neurons, we have a, a greater gill withdrawal reflex. <clears throat> well, I told you that there's almost, dif there's almost no difference between the action potentials in the sensory neurons in the initial in our initial condition and in, 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 the, in our sensitized um, condition. But there is actually a subtle difference. As you can see in this uh, figure, this is the, these are, uh, you know, the control, uh, you know, these are the action potentials in, in the sensory neuron in the control condition and the sensitized condition. And you can see that the action potential in our sensitized animal, uh, the action potentials are a little bit broadened. 
and uh, prolonged somehow. And I'm going to explain the exact um, cellular and molecular uh, mechanism underlying this, this um, <clears throat> broadened and prolonged action potential in sensory neurons, okay? So, yeah. So this is, this is our experimental setup, and this is what happens at the cellular level. Okay. Show, so, so, show, <laughs> sorry. Um, Short-term heterosynaptic facilitation. One important feature, uh, I mean, another important feature of sensitization is that unlike habituation, which was homosynaptic, it means that all of the things, all of those mechanisms that happen uh, <clears throat> in habituation, they happened at one synapse and we just needed one synapse, okay? But in a sensitization, we have two synapses, okay? We have a synapse uh, between uh, that, those uh, facilitating interneurons and the sensory neurons, which was an axoaxonic synapse and a modulatory synapse. And we had that uh, excitatory synaptic connection between the sensory neurons and motor neurons. So we have two synapses for sensitization. That's why it is called heterosynaptic. And again, you can see that uh, iconic neural circuit between the those sensory neurons which innervate the skin of the siphon and those motor neurons which innervate the muscles of the gill, that respiratory organ of the aplasia, and those sensitizing, uh, you know, interneurons or <clears throat> facilitating interneurons, 5-HT uh, stands for 5-hydroxytryptamine or uh, it's an R name for serotonin. <clears throat> and you can see that axonic cell, uh, axaxonic uh, synapse between the sensory neurons and these uh, interneurons, okay? So what happens is that <clears throat> basically what these interneurons do, they cause an increase in neurotransmitter release from the terminal, the synaptic terminals of these sensory neurons. I'm, I'm explaining the basis of facilitation. What these interneurons do is that they increase the neurotransmitter release from these sensory neurons. And that is the basis of facilitation. That is the basis of, 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 of uh, you know, I told you that uh, the, the synapse is now strengthened in, in, senses, in sensitized animal. Okay, so before the activation of those interneurons, you know, you can see one <clears throat> action potential of these um, sensory neurons when they fire, they create a, you know, a normal uh, <clears throat> EPSP motor neurons. But when they are sensitized, okay, after the activation of uh, interneurons, these synapses is, is, is facilitated, and after this facilitation, one action potential, okay, uh, releases more neurotransmitters, okay, and so we have a larger EPSB in those motor neurons, okay, so this is, this is very beautiful, this uh, actually summarizes the whole facilitation, okay. Uh, okay, fine. So that was it. Okay, now let's talk about presynaptic facilitation, and let me talk about facilitation first. So <clears throat> I want to talk about the synaptic uh, the strength of a synapse. Well, the strength of a synapse, um, as far as I know, and um, you know, I, 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 I understood it in this way that you know, the strength of a synapse is the extent to which the postsynaptic neuron is influenced by the presynaptic neuron. And if you are looking at an uh, excitatory chemical synapse, if we say that, for example, this synapse is very strong, it means that the postsynaptic neuron is excited more than other synapses, uh, or the, more than before, by the presynaptic neurons. And since it is a, since it is a, 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 a chemical synapse, it means that the, that presynaptic neuron uh, releases more neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft so that the postsynaptic neuron is influenced more, is activated more by the presynaptic neuron. Although, uh, you know, <clears throat> the reason for, uh, for a stronger synapse, you know, uh, 
Um, those presynaptic neurons are not always the reason for uh, strengthening of uh, a synapse. Sometimes some, some, some new things should happen um, in the postsynaptic uh, neuron, in the postsynaptic terminal, to strengthen the synapse. For example, the insertion of new receptors or more, or more sensitive receptors in postsynaptic neurons, okay? And I'm going to actually explain these different types of uh, facilitations and long-term potentiations in, uh, in the lecture on explicit memory. But anyway, so now that, 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 is, that is what I mean by uh, <clears throat> facilitation or strengthening of, of a synapse. And so now let's see how, uh, let's, let's talk about the fun part. Actually, I love this part more than anything else. Let's talk about uh, the molecular mechanisms underlying the short-term presynaptic facilitation. Fine. I love this figure. Uh, so <clears throat> what we have here, let me tell you what we have here first. We have three types of neurons and two synapses. We have those facilitating interneurons, which are activated by the electric shock and those sensory neurons which innovate the skin of the tail, okay? And there are serotonergic ones. It means that they release ser uh, serotonin. And there are, uh, you know, modulators or neuromodulatory interneurons. <clears throat> okay. And then we have these uh, sensory neurons, and this is a, uh, uh, sorry, my pointer is just funny now. Okay, siphon sensory neuron terminal. This is the terminal of the siphon sensory neurons. Uh, sorry. And then we have these motor neurons, okay, which innovate the gill. Uh, I told you we have two synapses. There is a synapse between these facilitating interneurons and the siphon. There's an ax-axonic synapse from axon of these interneurons to the axon, axonal terminals of these sensory neurons. And we have an excitatory synapse between these siphon um, uh, sensory neurons and motor neurons. So, <clears throat> I want to tell you how the activation of these facilitating interneurons strengthen, uh, strengthens the, uh, this synapse, okay? And basically what it does is that once these facilitating interneurons fire, they release serotonin. And serotonin starts uh, signal transduction pathways inside this, uh, inside the uh, terminal of a, uh, of, a, of a sensory neuron, axonal terminal of a sensory neuron. And both of these sense, uh, signal transduction pathways activated by these serotonin uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, actually, serotonin is a neuromodulator. Yeah, sorry. Um, anyway, so serotonin activates two, synap uh, two signal transduction pathways in these sensory neurons. And both of these uh, signal transduction pathways ultimately lead to the augmentation of transmitter release. They're going to uh, re uh, cause more neurotransmitters to be released, okay? And that's how they're going to facilitate this synapse or make this synapse stronger. And as I told you, the reason uh, the synapse is, is, is strengthened is that when more neurotransmitters are released, the postsynaptic neuron, in, which is, uh, you know, in our case, the motor neuron, in a way, in the gill, is now in, more influenced and more activated by those sensory neurons. And it means that, it, uh, you know, we're going to have a larger EPSP in these motor neurons as a result of more uh, transmitter release, okay? So now let's talk about those two main uh, signal transduction pathways, which <clears throat> actually increases the efficiency of transmitter release in these sensory neurons. Okay, so what happens, let's consider the very first one. Um, so we shock the tail once, because we are talking about short-term presynaptic facilitation. We shock the tail, sensory neurons are activated, motor neurons are activated, and these facilitating, e sorry, interneurons are activated, and these facilitating interneurons, they release serotonin. 
Serotonin is, is received by these G-protein copper receptors embedded in the membrane of siphon sensory neurons. This G-protein G copper receptor has a transducer, and this transducer is a stimulatory G-protein. I already talked about all of these uh, proteins and signal transduction pathways and these, um, you know, all of them in, in biosignaling uh, lectures. And that's why I actually did it. I did, that's why I, 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 I presented a whole series of lectures on, on biosignaling. <clears throat> So, a G-protein copper receptor receives uh, the uh, serotonin. Then, it activates a stimulatory G-protein. The alpha subunit of that stimulatory G-protein has an effector, and its effector is adenine cyclase. And uh, from those biosignaling lectures, we know that adenine cyclase is responsible for the production of CAMP from ATP. And CAMP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, is a second messenger. And what it does if that, uh, is that it activates protein kinase A. Again, I talked about uh, the different subunits of protein kinase A and all of that. So protein kinase A, as we know, has two subunits, a regulatory subunit and a, a catalytic subunit. Actually, there are two regulatory subunits and two catal uh, catalytic subunits. These regulatory subunits inhibit the catalytic activity of these catalytic subunits. <clears throat> and uh, the key to, 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 to uh, detach uh, these regulatory subunits from these catalytic subunits is, is, is the CAMP. So uh, on these regulatory subunits, <clears throat> on each one of them, we have two CNB or cyclic nucleotide bonding sites. Okay, uh, where CAMP binds and the and the um, <clears throat> uh, attachment of CAMP causes a conformational change in these regulatory subunits, and so now after that conformational change, you're detached from the catalytic subunits, and now the catalytic subunits are active, and what does the protein kinase does? Uh, uh, you know, the protein kinase actually uh, phosphorylates other proteins. One of the proteins this uh, uh, protein kinase A phosphorylates is these uh, voltage-gated uh, potassium channels. You may say, you may ask, so why should they be uh, phosphorylated? It's because when the action potential reaches the terminal, well, we need repolarization after each action potential, after the peak of an action potential. And these voltage-gated uh, potassium channels are important for repolarization, okay? But, one, uh, you know, when they are phosphorylated, they're actually closed. That phosphorylation causes them to be, to, to close. And the closure of these uh, voltage-gated potassium, cha potassium channels uh, stop or prevent repolarization, and so it prolongs the action potential. Remember that I told you that in sensitized animals, the action potentials in sensory neurons are prolonged or broadened, and that's the reason. But it's not all. Since they are closed, their closure actually causes the increase in the calcium influx through these voltage-gated calcium ion channels. And so we have more calciums in, the, in this active zone, and we know uh, actually, um, I learned from the lectures of Professor McMahon uh, in that Ypres course that calcium ions are necessary for the docking and the release of these uh, synaptic vesicles in the active zone. So we have an increase in the influx of these calcium ions through these, uh, of course, voltage-gated calcium channels. And so, uh, since we have more calcium ions, more of these synaptic vesicles are going to be released. And this is how this first signaling pathway augments or uh, enhances the uh, neurotransmitter release. Beautiful. Fantastic. And now let's talk about uh, the second pathway. Well, the second pathway is somehow similar to the first pathway because it also includes a, a, a G protein, a G protein copper receptor, and a protein kinase, but different types. So, in the second signaling pathway, Again, serotonin is, is, is received by another 
um, uh, G protein copper receptor. And now this G protein copper receptor is attached to, um, uh, you know, its transducer is another type of G protein called GQ. Okay? And again, um, in, our, in, in biosignal inductors, I told you the GQ proteins, um, their effector proteins are um, enzymes called phospholipase C or PLC. And what does uh, phospholipase C do? Well, phospholipase C cleaves the phosphatidyl inositol into diacetylglycerol or DAC and IP3 inositol uh, triphosphate. Yeah, sorry. But uh, we don't have to do anything with IP3, but we need diacylglycerol. Diacylglycerol plus those calcium ions and uh, a, a, new, uh, a, a type of phosph uh, uh, phospholipid in the membrane, they all activate a, new, uh, a different type of uh, protein kinase called protein kinase C. And what, the, what this protein kinase C is very beautiful, it's very, uh, uh, you know, wonderful. This protein kinase C phosphorylates and, and by doing that activates, phosphorylates and by doing that activates some uh, proteins which are involved in, in, in uh, mobilization of these synaptic vesicles from the reserve transmitter pool to the releasable transmitter pool. So, these protein kinases, they actually phosphorate and activate a bunch of proteins which are important for moving these synaptic vesicles from this re uh, reserve pool to the releasable pool. So by doing that, they increase the efficiency of transmitter release. And once they are in the releasable pool, we have enough calciums for them to be uh, docked and to be released into the synaptic cleft. And so more neurotransmitters are released, and so the modern neurons, you know, in, in modern neurons, uh, they cause a, a, a greater EPSP. And uh, as a result of that, a, a larger and a greater and more intense gill withdrawal reflex. That's so fantastic when I, when I look at it, when I first learned that, that I said, wow, that is fantastic, you know. <clears throat> Uh, beautiful, it's, it's just beautiful, I can say just, uh, it's, it's beautiful. So we have two signal transduction pathways activated by those serotonergic interneurons and both of these signal transduction pathways augment the transmitter release. And by doing that they cause a short-term presynaptic facilitation. Oops, okay. So yeah, uh, <clears throat> I explained um, how the ATP is transferred into cyclic AMP and then by other enzymes it can uh, recycle back to uh, AMP, but this is not what I'm going to talk about, this is what I'm going to talk about. You know, what you see here is an aplasia sensory neuron, of a, of, uh, it's a sensory neuron of, of, of aplasia, and <clears throat> what scientists did in this experiment was that, you know, they put this sensory neuron into uh, a serotonin bath. Okay, this is a cultured sensory neuron and they put it into a serotonin bath. And they measured the increase in, in, the, in, in the intercellular concentration of CAMP. And, you know, the concentration is uh, displayed by colors from uh, uh, blue to red Correspond, which correspond to, which corresponds to uh, low concentrations of CAMP to high concentrations of CAMP. Blue, no concentration or very low concentration. Red, very high concentration. And you can see that after applying uh, that serotonin or putting that sensory neuron in, 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 in a serotonin bath, you can see an increase in the intercellular concentrations of, of CAMP the concentration of CAMP, okay? And the increase in the production of CAMP persists until the serotonin is washed, okay? And now, <clears throat> 15 minutes after washing the uh, serotonin from the culture media, 
uh, we have no, almost no CAMP in the cell. And this is the experimental, uh, uh, you know, evidence for what I already explained in the previous uh, slide. That uh, application of serotonin causes the increase in CAMP or production of CAMP and uh, that CAMP activates protein kinase A and all that stuff, presynaptic facilitation. Okay. Line term sensitization. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> you know, um, one tail, one shock to the tail causes uh, short term uh, sensitization, okay, which may last minutes, okay, up to minutes. But five shocks to the tail with, of course, certain intervals causes long term sensitization which may last up to weeks. And now let's see uh, <clears throat> how the short-term facilita uh, facilitation or short-term sensitization uh, is converted to long-term sensitization. And the conversion of short-term memories to long-term memories is, is actually called consolidation. So now let's see how consolidation works. Basically consolidation uh, requires, um, <clears throat> happens as a result of a repetitive application of serotonin or repetitive uh, uh, activation of those facilitating interneurons. And uh, <clears throat> it also requires protein synthesis and it has, and it, it, it may cause, uh, not may, but it, you know, it certainly causes some structural changes. And structural changes and uh, protein synthesis, synthesis, sorry, synthesis, <laughs> and um, you know, uh, some alterations in gene expression. These are all characteristic features of long-term uh, changes. Okay, as I explained in again uh, biosignaling lectures. So now let's see how long-term sensitization happens. Wow. Okay. This is again our experimental setup. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we are working, we are, uh, you know, I'm going to explain what happens in this part. <sighs> again, we have those, uh, you know, three types of neurons and uh, uh, two synapses. But now let's see what happens when we, you know, when we try to induce line term sensitization. So what we do, is that we shock the tail more than one time, five times, for example, 10 times. And that causes um, a prolonged application or release of these serotonins. And a re uh, prolonged increase, prolonged release of these serotonin, serotonin molecules, okay? causes a prolonged increase in CAMP, okay? So, we shock the tail. What happens is that we have a lot of serotonin released, and uh, <clears throat> serotonin molecules actually increases the CAMP. And the increase in CAMP production is prolonged. Once the CAMP is, uh, the increase in CAMP production is prolonged, these um, catalytic subunits of protein kinase A's, which are activated by CAMP, they actually, uh, they're translocated to the, cell mem to the cell nucleus, okay? We have a, a, a prolonged uh, existence of, or presence of CAMP, and that causes the translocation of these catalytic subunits of protein kinase A's to the nucleus. In their path, okay, they also activate another kind of kinase, another type of kinase called mitogen activated protein kinase. Let's see what they do in the cell in the cell nucleus. <clears throat> I told you one of the characteristics of long term changes is alterations in gene expressions. And 
we are going to see how these protein kinase enzymes alter the gene expression. This is so beautiful. Uh, so, the catalytic subunit of the protein kinase A enzymes, they activate a transcription factor. They phosphorylate a transcription factor, and by doing that, they uh, activate that. That transcription factor is called CREP1. CREP stands for CMP Recognition Response Element Binding Protein. So, CREP1. We also have CREP2. But CREP2 is phosphorylated by MAPK, Mitogen Activated Protein Kinase. And unlike CREP1, which is activated when it's when it is phosphorylated, phosphorylation or CREP2 deactivates it. It's a good thing because CREP1 is a repressor. It actually inhibits the transcription of new genes, of, of genes. But CREP1 is a co-activator. It actually activates the transcription of, the, of, of, of genes. So what happens is that CREP1 is activated, CREP2 is deactivated, and now CREP1 binds to a promoter, promoter area or region of specific genes called CRE or CAMP recognition element. This uh, promoter region is, uh, you know, specific to those CAMP inducible genes. It means those, those genes which are transcriptions which the transcription depends on the uh, intercellular concentration of CAMP. Anyway, once the CREP1 binds to CRE, it recruits a co-activator uh, uh, protein. It's called CBP, interestingly, CREP binding protein. CREP binding protein has two functions, okay? First, it recruits RNA polymerase 2, which is necessary for the transcription of a gene of course. But it also acts as an acetyl transferase. It, it, uh, satellite, it acetylates the histone proteins. Uh, unfortunately, I, uh, you know, I'm going to show you uh, a picture, but I can, you know, uh, none of these, uh, none of these things that I'm explaining are, are uh, shown here. So um, I'm actually going to explain them again, but anyway, so CREP1 binds to CRE, it recruits uh, CREP binding protein or CBP, and CREP binding protein recruits uh, RNA polymerase 2, and also it uh, <clears throat> satellites histones, okay? Histone proteins. And by doing that, okay, CREP1 active and CBP activate uh, the transcription of some specific genes. CREP1 actually activates the transcription of two genes. One of those genes is, uh, encodes a protein called ubiquitin hydrolase. And let me first explain what ubiquitin hydrolase does. Ubiquitin hydrolase, after it is uh, synthesized, and its transcription and the uh, its mRNA transcription act is activated by CREP1. What it does is that it degrades the regulatory segments or reg regulatory subunits of protein kinase A's. It degrades them. You know, we need CAMP to detach those regulatory subunits, but <clears throat> after the CAMP. Um, levels of CA, the level of con uh, the concentration of CAMP decreases to the basal level, again, those uh, regulatory subunits are going to inhibit the catalytic subunit or segment of, of protein kinase A. But now they're degraded. Degradation of these uh, regulatory segments or subunits of protein kinase A causes the persistent activity of protein kinase A. They're no longer inhibited. There's no regulatory uh, subunit. And now, as a result of that persistent activity of protein kinase A, we have, uh, you know, enhanced transmitter release. Beautiful. So, that was the function of ubiquitin hydrolase. 
okay? And almost 25%, as I recall, I'm not sure, but uh, almost near to 25% of these uh, regulatory segments are uh, uh, degraded. So that was, ubiquitin hydrolase was uh, one of the proteins, um, which is uh, transcription, is activated by CRIP1. Another gene, which is transcription, act is activated by CRIP1, is a gene for another transcription factor called CEBP. C stands for uh, the CAAT box and enhancer binding protein. Okay, so uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a transcription factor which binds to the CAAT uh, promoter area or box. <clears throat> Here you can see that it forms, uh, 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 you know, here, it can, here you see a, a, a homodimer of CEBP, but, but it also can uh, form a heterodimer with an activating factor. I'm going to actually show you there. But anyway, uh, that transcription factor, CEBP, activates the transcription of other genes that they encode some important proteins for the growth of new synaptic connections. Like, for example, uh, elongation factor 1 alpha. Uh, elongation factor 1, EF1 alpha. That gene, and many of those genes are actually important for uh, the uh, <clears throat> stabilizing the cytoskeletal structure, okay, this, uh, the cytoskeleton and, and, and um, the uh, newly formed synaptic connections. As I told you, in long-term sensitization, we also have structural changes, not just functional changes um, in enzymes, but we have structural changes. And so that uh, CEBP is a transcription factor which activates the transcription of important genes which encode uh, proteins which are important for uh, growth of new synaptic connections, okay? And this is long-term sensitization. The reason it is called long-term, well, we have a persistent, we have persistent activity of protein kinases, okay? Since the, uh, because of that degradation of uh, regulatory subunits, these protein kinases are always active. Uh, they no longer need CAMP. And we also have new synaptic connections. And those new synaptic connections they, uh, themselves, uh, they strengthen the uh, synaptic connectivity between sensory neurons and motor neurons. Fantastic. Okay. So that was uh, uh, okay. Yeah, that was uh, the molecular mechanisms of long-term sensitization. It's not finished. So I already talked about uh, most of these uh, uh, enzymes, but this is what I want to uh, explain in detail. I told you that one of the genes uh, that its transcription is activated by CREB1 is CBP, and as I told you, it uh, you know it forms a homodimer with itself, you know. C, uh, CBP is a monodimer. It's a, it's, a, it's a monomer. It can form a dimer, a homodimer with itself, okay? That's why it is called homo. And it binds to the C, C, CAAT box. But it can also form a heterodimer with another uh, kind of uh, uh, transcription co-activator called activating factor. And it acts on TAAC box, okay? It, it, it binds to that part. And uh, you know, they activate a bunch of genes which are important for the growth of those new uh, uh, axonal terminals and, 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 and uh, branches of, of uh, axonal terminals. And uh, one of those genes, for example, is uh, elongation factor 1 alpha. Okay. I also want to talk about uh, APCAM. APCAM is, is uh, again, 
uh, an important uh, <clears throat> uh, protein. Okay, APCAM stands for Aplasia Cell Adhesion Molecule. Cell adhesion molecules are uh, glycoproteins, which are um, important in stabilizing the cell-to-cell -cell adhesions. And uh, the uh, Plasia cam or AP cam or cell adhesion molecule is actually, uh, you know, as you see, um, uh, it resembles uh, immunoglobulin or antibodies. Um, and it is, in fact, an Ig-like protein. That's why it is called Ig-like. And there are two types of uh, AP cam. We have these GPI or glycosyl phosphoinositide linked isoform. There are two isoforms of, of, of uh, AP cam. We have a G uh, glycosine phospho phosphoinositide linked uh, isoform of AP cam, which stabilizes the synaptic connection, the pre existed uh, pre existing synaptic connections. Okay, here. <clears throat> Well, we have another uh, isoform called transmembrane isoforms, isoform of CAMP, okay? Sorry, not CAMP, uh, APCAM. And as you can see, these uh, trans transmembrane or TM isoforms of APCAM, they, they adhere or connect uh, two bundles of axons, okay? But in order to, you know, if this bundle of axon one wants to uh, grow and form a new synapse, it should uh, detach from this bundle. So APCAM, the Transmembrane isoform of APCAM should be downregulated because if it exists, it adheres these two bundles and it doesn't allow this uh, bundle, this terminal of, uh, of, of, of uh, axon, this bundle of axon to grow. What happens is that <clears throat> one of the changes in uh, line term sensitization is that this TM isoform of APCAM is downregulated. And endocytosis of this happens, of this APCAM, of this uh, uh, TM isoform of APCAM happens. And downregulation of TM isoform of APCAM causes defasciculation. It means that it uh, detaches the bundles of axons. Fasciculus is, 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 uh, is the name given to bundles of, uh, slender bundles of, uh, you know, uh, fibers like nerve fibers or axons, okay? And, and, and so uh, the downregulation, differential downregulations of transmembrane isoforms of APCAM causes defasciculation and the detachment of these two uh, adhered. Uh, bundles of axons. And now, when it is detached, it can form new synapses. So, the two bundles, and imagine that these two are here. When that bundle, when this bundle, uh, if it wants to grow, it cannot. It is attached to, the, to this bundle, to the, uh, uh, you know, to the bundle at the bottom. So what happens when uh, we, uh, we when we apply uh, long term when we induce long term sensitization is that um, the APCAM the uh, transmembrane uh, <clears throat> isoform of APCAM is downregulated and so it detaches and it can grow its own connections it can form its own synapses. I actually want uh, you know first when I uh, searched about the APCAM and I read that it is downregulated. I said, why do we need downregulation of a protein uh, for, uh, you know, sensitization or growth of new synaptic connections? And this is why, okay? I'm, I'm, 
I'm really, uh, you know, this is beautiful again, like all of those uh, mechanisms. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's review the role of protein kinase A in short-term and long-term sensitization. It, it, you know, it involved in, uh, in both short-term and long-term sensitization. And in short-term sensitization, uh, you know, the CAMP is produced and the regulatory subunits or segments are detached momentarily or temporarily. But after the CAMP is uh, recycled to AMP, uh, these regulatory subunits are again going to bind to uh, catalytic subunits and, and inhibit their catalytic activity. But in long-term sensitization, since we have altered gene expression and we have those uh, uh, newly uh, synthesized ubiquitin um, hydrolase enzymes, those regulatory subunits are deleted, are uh, degraded. And degradation of them causes the uh, <clears throat> persistent activity of the catalytic subunits, okay? And they, uh, sorry, phosphorate the substrates. Okay. Wow. Okay. Remember, uh, Professor McMahon and Professor Gilbert, I asked you this question. I forgot asking this question from uh, Professor Matthew and Professor Ashmer. Um, I asked you this question that, okay, what are those genes which are important for the growth of new synaptic connections? And I found the answer. One of those genes, you know, uh, of course one of them was elongation factor one alpha, as I explained, but one of the other genes, one of the other proteins, is called APTBL, aplasia toluate BMP-like one. BMP stands for a bone morphogenetic uh, protein-like. It's, it's a weird name, okay? I don't know why they call this. But it is APTBL1, okay? And so, let me explain the role of uh, APTBL in, uh, in, in, in um, you know, in synaptic changes or synaptic growth in long-term facilitation. So, again, we have 5 uh, HD CAMP protein kinase A transcription and trans, uh, translation. And one of those genes, which is uh, synthesized as a result of that, uh, the activation of CREP1 and CBP, is a pleasure TBL1. What the pleasure TBL1 does inside the sensory neuron itself is that it modifies the elements or components of, of uh, cytoskeleton or intracellular um, cytoskeleton uh, components, okay, like microtubulins and, and um, those uh, important structures, structural proteins, okay, and by doing that it actually uh, causes the growth of new synaptic connections inside the sensory neuron. So it modifies the components of, of um, intracellular, intracellular uh, cytoskeletal um, components or proteins, sorry. But a pleasure can get out of the uh, sensory neuron. It can be secreted into the uh, synaptic cleft and there it activates some components of, it mod again it modifies some components of extracellular matrix, ECM, like for example it changes uh, pro-collagen to collagen and collagen is a very important role, a very important component of ECM or extracellular matrix. It also activates some growth factors. Uh, for example, one of those growth factors that it activates is uh, TGF beta. And I already explained, um, uh, I talked about TGF beta, I introduced that and its receptor in, uh, in biosignaling lectures. TGF beta stands for transforming growth factor beta. And it is that active, uh, that uh, trans uh, transforming growth factor 
uh, beta is activated by AP3BL. Once it is activated, that uh, growth factor, it binds to both to uh, you know sensory neurons, to motor neurons, and even to glial cells. Let's see what consequences does this uh, uh, binding of these a um, act uh, active growth factors have. Um, yeah, let's see what happens when it binds to these uh, cells. It can bind to uh, a, a specific receptor called serin uh, thuranin receptor, serin thuranin kinase receptor. Okay, it's a receptor which is coupled with the serin thuranin kinase enzyme. Uh, at the surface of this uh, axonal terminal of sensory neuron, and once it is activated. Once it is uh, received, it activates a transcription, uh, a signaling pathway or a signaling cascade, which again leads to uh, transcription and translation of new genes and uh, those proteins which are important in cell growth. Okay, so it is somehow um, uh, it comes back; it gets back to uh, the sensory neuron itself. Okay, so it has a feedback connection somehow. So, once it is, uh, once it is uh, uh, received by the uh, serine thuranin kinase uh, receptor, it activates a cascade of signal transduction pathways which are important for cell growth in the sensory neuron. Okay? It also binds to uh, receptors at the surface of modern neurons and in modern neurons, it activates some, uh, again, signal transduction pathways and uh, growth factors, uh, which are important for uh, cell growth. And it causes these modern neurons to complement the changes, the structural changes which happen, uh, which occur in sensory neurons. You know, in sensory neurons, you know, a new synaptic terminal is formed here. And so we have a, a new postsynaptic terminal, of course. And these modern neurons, so they, they need to complement those structural changes. And the, activa and, 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 uh, the way these modern neurons understand that they need to activate some new uh, processes in order to complement those structural changes is through these uh, transforming growth factors. Beautiful. They, uh, they also attach these transforming growth factor beta uh, <clears throat> you know, these active growth factors also bind to glial cells. And glial cells, once these uh, growth factors bind to them, they secrete more components of extracellular matrix, okay, in order to, which help to stabilize and, and strengthen the synaptic connectivity between the sensory neurons and motor neurons. And uh, I, I love this, uh, these processes so much, you know, the, the way you understand. Actually, my understanding is very, uh, very superficial. It's not profound at all. But, you know, I, I truly love, I really love these uh, molecular activities, important, which are important for synaptic connectivity and, and the uh, formation of new synapses, the synaptogenesis. You know? Okay, so, yeah. And this is the function of APTBL, one of those proteins which is um, synthesized as a result of line term facilitation. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, okay. Histone acetylation. Whew. Fine. Uh, that's the end of the lecture. Almost the end. So, <clears throat> what you see here is the chromatin. And chromatin uh, is actually a structure in our uh, uh, DNA and, uh, you know, uh, genetic material. The basic unit of a chromatin is a nucleosome. And a nucleosome, what it has is that 147 base pairs of DNA rotate or, you know, they are wrapped around four uh, octomer uh, four, four core histone proteins, which are called octomers, 
1.6 times. So 147 base pairs of DNA are wrapped around the, these uh, octomers of histones 1.6 times. And these uh, octomers, uh, they consist of core. Uh, they have four core histone proteins. Histone 2A, histone 2B, histone 3, and histone 4. So this is the basic structure of a nucleosome. What I wanted to talk about is that, you know, you see they're very close. These, you know, uh, these segments of DNA are, are really close to each other. And you can really, uh, you know, enzymes which are important for transcription, like transcription factors, or they're not enzymes, but factors, but, you know, um, uh, RNA polymerase enzymes, they cannot really bind to these uh, segments of DNA. So, the reason we, uh, they're very closely packed is that these histone proteins, they have uh, uh, an N-terminal tail, okay? And in their tail, they have a positive, positively charged li uh, lysine residues, okay? DNA has a negative charge. We all know that because of those phosphates. So DNA has a negative charge, and these uh, histones in their N-terminal tails, they have a positive lysine residue. Here you can see that. This is a lysine residue, and it has a positive charge at the end of it. And that positive charge causes an electrostatic attraction uh, between these, uh, the negatively charged DNA and positively charged um, uh, octomers of histone proteins. And so they're closely packed. What acetylation ha does is that, you know, an enzyme like that uh, uh, activation uh, co-activator, transcription co-activator, uh, co uh, Krebs binding protein, it acts as a tr uh, acetyl transferase. It acetylates, acetylates these lysine residues by attaching the, uh, an acetyl uh, to these, uh, to the tail of these uh, histones, it removes this negative charge, this positive charge. When this positive charge is removed, um, now the DNA Actually, uh, you know, the electrostatic connection is, is, uh, is now not that strong between the DNA and uh, histones. And DNA is now more accessible and more amenable to gene transcription. It, is, it can be uh, easily accessed by those uh, gene transcription enzymes like RNA polymerase enzymes, okay? So this is the basis of histone acetylation and the reason for histone acetylation. We need histone acetylation so that the uh, specific uh, parts of the DNA can be accessed by uh, transcription enzymes. So again, you can see that the transcription is blocked in these closely packed histone and DNA or nucleosomes. And here, when, they're, when the histones are acetylated, the transcription is, uh, uh, you know, uh, can happen. And this is what happens again. We have CREP1, CREP2, uh, CREP2 actually. This is the basal state before the CREP1 and CREP2 are activated. CREP2 um, uh, inhibits the transcription, as I told you. It's, an, it's a co-repressor, uh, but CREP1 is a co-activator or and, uh, it activates the transcription. Uh, yeah. And this is a nucleosome in the DNA. Let's see what happens. Before I explain this, I just remembered one important fact. The fact that we have uh, both a repressor and an activator, and an activator uh, in long-term sensitization, it means that there is a certain level of threshold for long-term sensitization, for, line, for, for, for the consolidation of short-term memories to long-term memories, okay? And so, 
if we want to convert short-term memories to long-term memories, we need to reach that threshold, okay, so that the co-repressors are inhibited and co-activators or act, uh, uh, transcription factors are activated, okay? Those, um, and the threshold is regulated by, for example, the focus, mood, social context, for example. And so these are important factors in regulating the threshold of long-term sensitization and uh, memory consolidation. Just wanted to point, uh, explain that, that important concept as well. Okay, so uh, let's see what happens. 5-HT activates protein kinase A, active, uh, protein kinase A activates uh, CREP1 in protein. Uh, CREP1, uh, it is activated, it recruits CBP, CREP binding protein. And as I told you, CBP acts as an acetyl transferase. It acetylates the histones, or, uh, yeah, the histones, and now uh, the DNA is, 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 uh, can be ac accessed by uh, polymerase 2. The CBP also recruits polymerase 2 and TBP, which is TATA uh, box, uh, binding protein, and once, they're bound, uh, once they bind to this uh, part of the DNA, the, they can actually transcript, uh, tr uh, transcribe a G. Ooh. They first transcribe the gene of CBP, which is itself uh, an other transcription factor. They also transcribe the gene of uh, ubiquitin hydrolase. So this is why we need acetyl tra uh, uh, transferase and acetylation. And this is the role of the main role of CB CBP or CREP binding protein. Wow. Okay, that's it. That was sensitization and uh, <clears throat> that was the very first section of the lectures on implicit memory. In the next uh, lecture, I'm going to explain the some structure, I'm going to talk about actually the, some uh, structural changes which happen as a result of sensitization and also, you know, uh, habituation. And I'm going to talk about the mechanisms which are important for maintaining these structural changes as a result, which happen as a result of long-term facilitation. And I'm also going to talk about uh, classical conditioning. I'm going to introduce the concept of classical conditioning as well as a very important uh, subtype of non-declarative or implicit memories. Sorry for uh, the English. I mean, some, you know, I try to pronounce words as, as accurate as possible, but I'm not native, uh, so sorry for that. Sorry for some... Uh, mistakes and errors um, and thank you so much for watching these this video and other videos i hope you can uh, uh, you can watch other videos as well thank you so much bye